This is Seeds Podcast, bringing you tips, conversations, and information about applied behavior analysis. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to Seeds Podcast. We are in season three, and in season three, we'll be discussing how you know the science of ABA is not just unique to the autism population, but it's also applicable in so many different fields. So um, today we are very fortunate to have uh, Bethan here with us and my co-host Chewing. But first of all, let me just quickly introduce myself because I'm not, um, you know, for those of you who've been following our podcast, um, you know, our beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous Alexa, um, she's taking a short break, so I'm just filling in for her. But um, here it goes. So my, my name is Sien. I am the principal at Seed Autism Services. I'm also a board certified behavior analyst. Uh, my background is in special education. So um, I'm really excited about doing this season together with um, CY. So, you know, I'll let her go ahead and introduce herself. She was um, on the other side of, um, she was, we interviewed her um, the first episode, but now she's going to be co-hosting with me for the rest of season three. So CY, go ahead. So hi everyone, it's CY, or you should know me as Chewing here. So um, like CN, I'm also a board certified behavior analyst and currently I'm doing my PhD uh, in the UK. So my current research is on uh, implementing a school-wide PBS uh, in schools. So very happy to be back again on the uh, SEED podcast and I'll be happy to join everyone again to, throughout this whole season. Yeah, thank you CN. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, Betten, I'm just going to let you introduce yourself, but I, um, what do you think? Certainly, I'm more than <laughs> happy to do that. Hello, CN. Hello, CY. You know, CY and I are old friends and have been for a couple of years now. I am Bethan Mai Williams. I am a speech and language therapist, and I am also a board certified behavior analyst and I run a clinical excellence network for speech and language therapists with an interest in ABA, and that is under one of my professional bodies, the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy. So I do lots of things. I also work for Queen's University Belfast as an MSc dissertation supervisor and work the length and breadth of Britain and indeed anywhere else where someone will have me. Thanks, Beth. And it sounds like you wear a lot of different hats. There's lots of interesting things going on. And I think, um, like, uh, like you, my, my remit is to hopefully make people understand that behavior analysis, ABA, is, uh, it, it's, not, it's not a therapy. It's not a specific therapy, but it's a set of scientific principles that will, in fact, in fact make whatever it is that you aim to do be even better. So... What being a behavior analyst has done to me, I hope, is that it's made me become a better speech and language therapist and to deliver better services to people with communication issues, irrespective of their diagnosis. Oh, oh that's really great. So, Batten, do you mind to also tell us a little bit more about how do you started all this journey? Like, do you start it as, so what makes you want to go into like speech and language pathology and what makes you want to pursue a BCBA? So, how did it all start? Like, tell us more. Well, I should warn you from the start that speech and language therapists like talking very much. So, you may have to cut a lot of my rambling anecdotes, but. Uh, Briefly, uh, I grew up in Zambia and Papua New Guinea, and as I mentioned to you uh, women earlier, I've spent a lot of my time in Malaysia going back and forth while I was in the Pacific. We, we're a, we are in a family who speak English and Welsh, so even though we lived in Papua New Guinea, we always spoke Welsh to our father. Papua New Guinea is a very diverse country, has 700 languages, so it was no big deal to be bilingual in Papua New Guinea. I think that started my interest in language in general. Um, then I became a speech and language therapist and enjoyed that very much and did that for a, a long time, but always felt there was a piece missing. I always felt that we were very good at understanding uh, the developmental trajectory of language and that we were good, well-meaning people, but there was something missing. And I think what was missing was what brought me to um, ABA. What actually happened, I'm based in North Wales and Bangor University was the first place in Europe to offer an MSc in ABA and I'd, I'd heard about, a, I'd been using a speech and language therapy intervention that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, PECS, Picture Exchange Communication System, and I 
took to it instantly. I took to the fact that there was a clear protocol, there was a clear strategy, it was replicable. I saw dramatic results. And when, um, but I didn't realize that was ABA. I had no idea, but when, but when Bangor University started their MSc in ABA, I was in contact with a couple of colleagues there and I brought them into one of the schools I worked in to look at um, the work I was doing with PECS. I said, I'd really like you to help me evaluate this. And they said to me, you might be interested in the MSc in ABA. And I did it and it, it changed my life both professionally and personally because I am a mother of two children and one of my children had community has um still has communication issues that was apparent to me from when she was about three or four and i knew even what was very difficult even as a speech and language therapist i knew i didn't have the skills i needed to really help her so as i was doing my msc i i realized that this could help the children and the adults that i work with but also my own child and uh, i it has made i couldn't even begin to tell you the enormous positive changes this, it has brought to my family, my daughter, and many, many people that I work with. So that's why I'm here, and that's why I want to help other people understand what it is that ABA can do to make whatever it is that they do even better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, that's really nice, and really nice to hear that how you know your your experience and how the knowledge in ABA and, and also in speech and language pathology has helped you not only with your clients but also your own family and your own life as well so that's really good so can you also tell us a little bit more so so how is it like to you know have dual credentials you know like how does this uh, your knowledge in both field has helped to like complement uh, each other in regards to your job you know um how does this influence your approach you know to work with your client and that sort of things well, it was really interesting because I, I was the first person in Britain to be duly qualified. Um, so I had to forge my own path and I, and I had to work out how to do everything that each regular, regulatory body needs me to do, how to combine the two, and also how to support other people um, who wanted to go on that path. We currently have six duly qualified um, professionals in the States, three of those sorry, in, in the UK, uh, three of those I have supervised directly. There are seven, but one has gone back to, to Ireland where she's from originally. So there are currently other people who are training. In terms of how to bring those two worlds together, well, that in itself I could talk about for a week, but I won't, you'll be glad to know. Effectively, what, as a speech and language therapist, what you're learning is, as I mentioned earlier, um, a developmental trajectory, how language develops and language taxonomies, different parts of language, this very traditional way of looking at language, looking at semantics, what words mean, phonetics and phonology, the sounds in words, uh, morphology, how, how words are put together, glued together. So that's the way you look at that. And there are various language theory. So it's driven by, by, by theory. So one of the theories, for example, is that we have a language acquisition device, which rather woolly things so like that we, we have this LAD and it helps us acquire language but it, it's not explicit in the way that we would expect as behavior analysts. Now what a behavior analyst um, does clearly is, as you both know is we are underpinned by the seven dimensions of applied behavior analysis and what we look at essentially is the three-term contingency, the antecedent, the behavior, the consequence. Behavior is reinforced by its consequences and when I speak to people who don't know much about behavior analysis and who clearly don't want a long and boring lecture on it. But what is behavior analysis? What we say is behavior analysis is essentially good teaching. It's about breaking things down into their component parts. It's about using reinforcement to make sure that someone enjoys what it is that they do and does it again. And thirdly, that we take data on what it is that we do. And if it's working well, we carry on. And if it isn't, we have a rethink. So bringing that bringing those underpinnings of behavior analysis to speech and language therapy i think it's it should be clear to see that all what that does is makes whatever it is you're doing as a behavior as a speech and language therapist better the the, the thing for me was a a, a huge revelation and, and and i'm clearly when we do a podcast we're dealing with many different people who have different levels of of knowledge and different levels of motivation but 
we talk, as, as you will both know, we talk about mans and tats. In the world of speech and language therapy, we would call that re um, requesting and commenting. So we know that small children uh, will will ask for things that they want. They'll ask for, they'll ask for a ball, perhaps, because they want to play with it. But later comes this really important step where they will comment on a ball, not because they want a ball, but because they want to share that pleasure. You, I'm a human, you're a human, and I want to point this out. It's of mutual interest to us. Now, as a big behavior analyst, what you learn is the power of the man, that if a child gets to ask for something and it's something they like, oh, great, this is interactions working for me, I'll do more of it, which is very, very different to what happens in many speech and language therapy clinics where children are asked to tact to comment on things. What's this? What's this? What's this? Now, clearly, we're not here just to talk about people with autism because this applies to everyone, but I think it's easy to see how powerful it is to use a man with a child with autism instead of a tat, because a lot of children with autism, they don't yet have that issue of, I will share with you the pleasure of naming this object. So as a speech and language therapist, and certainly this was the case for me for many years, I would be in a clinical situation with children and I would be trying to get them perhaps to name things, to tag things, and they weren't interested. And I knew that they weren't interested, but I didn't know what to do about it. Now, I do know what to do about it. So that's an enormously empowering thing to be able to do, to start thinking, what is it that this child wants and to develop an intervention that is truly child-centered because what one child is interested in and is happy to engage in activities for is totally different from another child. So again, as you two will know, every single approach we use, although we're underpinned by our seven dimensions, every single child, every single individual is unique. And our job is to say, what do you like? What is fun for you? What is meaningful for you? And I will give you that in bucket loads and make you really enjoy what it is that we're learning together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> that kind of answer a um, couple of questions that I already have. Um, so I won't ask them, but I think um, what I was interested in is to kind of know, like you said, you know, you you know, you're the first dually certified uh, BCBA SLP in the UK and you kind of have to forge like your own, um, you know, to kind of get that going and get that started. So how was it um, like for you when you had to maybe, you know, communicate to other SLPs and have to share, share that knowledge that now you have that's so powerful and so useful? How was, how, how, at, you know, that your colleague, you know, the other SLB um, respond um, to, 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 to these things that you were telling us earlier uh, about this whole, you know, let's work on, you know, motivation and, and let's capture that motivation and let's work on requesting, um, you know, how did it go? And, and, and especially the data piece, you know, you mentioned how um, it's just ABA is good teaching, you know, we collect data, um, how, how did that go with the um, SLPs? Well, when I became a board certified behavior analyst, I was working for the NHS, National Health Service, and that's our state funded um, health system, which, which is, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a whole other podcast on the, the, the pros and cons of the NHS. So I'm not going to go into that now, but clearly a very large bureaucratic machine that does things in a specific way isn't perhaps the best place to bring in uh, innovation. What I did find is when I became uh, a BCBA, that the schools I worked in, because I was predominantly working in special and mainstream schools, the, the teaching staff and the teaching assistants were absolutely fantastic and still are, were really interested in ways to make a really tough job difficult. And my favorite thing to do is to not be on a home program or in a clinic, but is to be in a classroom, sitting on a chair next to a teaching assistant saying, you are the one that really matters you're with this child all day, I am going to teach you how to do things which will make a huge difference to this child and will make a huge difference to your job and the meaning your job brings you. So my, uh, the, the NHS, the National Health Service, the managerial strata, if you like, weren't particularly interested in, in that, although people at grassroots levels were. That was one of many reasons why I made the decision to, to go freelance which gave me much more freedom. Now, setting up the Clinical Excellence Network, 
for speech and language therapists with an interest in ABA was really important to do that under our professional body to really emphasize the fact that we were part of the mainstream and we were not challenging the narrative. Speech and language therapists are highly respected in Britain. There are 17,000 of us and the profession has been in place for um, since the 50s, I think. So our issue was that this is about becoming speech and language therapy, becoming better speech and language therapists. That worked very well because as with many professions, there is a push for more evidence-based practice. And what the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists are very honest about is that actually there is not, there isn't much evidence for current paediatric speech and language therapy interventions. And that's something that all of us must face. That doesn't mean that that's a criticism. That's saying this is where the profession is now and this is where the profession needs to go. Now, what behaviour analysis gives you is a way of as a, of creating evidence, if you are if you are putting in place an intervention, a behaviour analyst can come along and say, "Well, th this is how th 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 these are the things that we want to measure, and this is how we're going to measure it, and this is the way that we can look at if things are effective or not." Which is clearly of huge value to speech and language therapy. So when we set up our clinical excellence network, we 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 were overwhelmed, and myself and my co-founders, Sonia. Uh, Mulvaney, who is our uh, membership secretary, we were overwhelmed by the amount of interest and goodwill, uh, not just from speech and language therapists, but from behaviour analysts who were really interested in working with speech and language therapists, who said, we know you've got lots of interesting things to tell. We know we don't have all the pieces of the jigsaw. Can you please do that? So that's been going now for about four years. We have conferences uh, in in. Uh, in times of non-COVID, we have face-to-face -face conferences and during COVID, we've carried on doing it virtually. We meet in London at the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapy headquarters every March and we meet in Manchester every um, September. And our, our face, we have a closed Facebook group, which is indeed open to anyone who's a registered behaviour technician or above. So we have members from all over the world and we have vigorous honest debates you know quite often speech and language therapists will say what is it that you lot do and we will explain and in the same way we will turn around so behavior analysts will turn around, why do you do that so it's been open it's been honest it's been courteous and we and i, I as a supervisor of people who are training to become bspas or people who are doing their mscs i will always say to them if people challenge you, enjoy it. That's the intellectual and professional challenge of our of our profession. We need to be able to explain what it is we do because if you don't, if you're not, if you're not a behaviour analyst yourself, a lot of what a behaviour analyst will do might not seem clear. But that's an invitation for the behaviour analyst to to explain it. So that's been really positive. Our, our the Royal College has been incredibly supportive of us they've written up a couple of things um in in our in our professional magazine that we we've done also the uh, queen's university who i work for in Bangor, they will send students my way who have particular interest in what behavior analysts call uh, verbal behavior what speech and language therapists call communication speech language and communication needs so we have um, my students have produced a couple of uh, dissertations on um, the different ways that speech and language therapists and behavior analysts um, assess children so that's a really interesting one another one is of attitudes uh, within professions to each other and i am making more um professional links with other duly qualified staff uh, one of the people that i'm doing quite a lot with at the moment is a duly qualified well she's she's not a bcba but she has done her msc in aba she's an academic occupational therapist called aditi Mera, and she actually does a podcast called the ABA and OT podcast with Mandy Mason, who's a BCBA based in Perth in Australia, Aditi's in uh, Chicago, and I am going to be a guest for them in a couple of weeks talking about this very thing, because Aditi is doing with OT and ABA exactly what it is that I aspire to do with speech and language therapy and ABA. I'll have to check that out, because as I was preparing for this podcast, I'm thinking, I don't know if I know of anyone that's dually certified, and maybe that's because my circle is just so small. But like OT and um, BCBA, I, I, I think I felt like that 
you know, SLP, BCBA, I think, you know, we're gradually building up the number, but then with BCBA and OT, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's good to hear that that's someone out there and I'll definitely check out the podcast. It, it's great. And uh, two incredibly engaging, interesting, uh, very able women who, 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 who offer a really clear and straightforward explanation of those things. We do actually in Britain have two duly qualified um, uh, people who are, who are OTs and uh, BCBs. Um, and there are, there is, I think, well, I know there's at least one, there might be two, but there is one amazing person who is a BCBA, a speech and language therapist and an occupational therapist. And, you know, in wow. my more ambitious moments, I am sometimes tempted to train as an OT because they do fabulous stuff. But I don't know if my husband or children could put up with that. Okay. So, um, oh, I have so many questions in my head and I'm trying to like arrange them and, and think about how do I, okay, just give me a second. Um, okay, let's just talk about, all right, the Malaysian context a little bit. Let's just do a quick shift and just talk about Malaysian context a little bit. Now in Malaysia, um, if a child, things have improved tremendously, right? So now um, kids are identified a lot earlier. Um, they get intervention a lot earlier. Um, you know, but the, the common um, recommendation, and I'm going to just speak from, you know, because I work with the early learners with really young population who um, usually are diagnosed with autism. Uh, the recommendation given by the developmental pediatrician is usually, okay, you know, so your child has autism, so go find an OT, an occupational therapist, you know, go get um, speech services. Um, and then in recent years, they start to recommend ABA as well. So that's good progress, I guess, um, for us. So now when, um, when I get call, you know, from parents saying, okay, so, you know, I was told to do one of, you know, these three things, you know, so you, you come up as an ABA service provider. So my question is, what do you do? So after I explain to them, okay, this is what, you know, services would look like for a really young learner, and this is what we do. And then they say, well, that sounds like what, you know, my child is doing with a speech therapist, you know, um, it sounds like you guys are targeting um, very similar things, um, you know, like the vocalizing or um, requesting or playing and engagement and um, social referencing and all that kind of stuff. So then they ask, because of course, cost is an issue. Insurance is not available here in this part of the world. So then they'll ask questions. So which one should I do first? Because I mean, it sounds it, like it's so similar. Um, should I do ABA? Should I just stick to speech? You know, what should I do? So, you know, in, in your professional opinion and experience, um, what are some of the things that, you know, you typically, you know, talk about, or, you know, if you're in, a, <clears throat> in such a conversation with parents, what would you say to the parents? I think that's an excellent question and, and summarizes the very scary situation you find yourself in often as a parent. And one of the metaphors I, I use is it, it's like you're on a roundabout and it's going round and round and you're seeing people go, choose me, choose me, choose me. And your gut feeling as a parent is to do everything that you can. And I have been there myself where you go, I'll bring in this person, I'll bring in this person, I'll bring in this person. But what that means is two things. First of all, as a parent, you end up project managing an entire interdisciplinary team at a time when you're probably the most stressed you've ever been in your life and you're desperately worried about your child. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, do, do people come at the presenting issue, which is the child with a communication disorder or, or, or delay or, or issues around learning and cognition, do they come at it with the same scientific underpinnings now the, the the fact is that quite often they don't so and i and i i generalize hugely here but one but one of the issues you might find is that an occupational therapist and i emphasize i work with many of them and have done several research projects with occupational therapists but some might talk about sensory seeking behavior and that children need a sensory diet or access to various chewy toys, wobble cushions, weighted blankets. Now, that's, that's their theoretical perspective. As a behavior analyst, that's a difficult one to deal with because what you're having to say to parents is, 
If you do that, you're allowing your child unconditional access to reinforcement, and it might not even be reinforcement. In fact, those things might serve as escape and avoidance. So, and I'm, I'm currently having one of these conversations with a family I work with, and the OT and I are working together and really helping to see where that's coming from. So it's working well, but you, you, ha you have to be able to say, so that's the first thing. So OT might do that. A speech and language therapist, many of them are of the school of thought, and I was for a very long time, and to a certain extent still am, that if you provide a language rich environment and baby the child in lots of opportunities for play and language that things magically fall into place it's a, it's it's not the sort of focused approach of a behavioral analyst now for some kids that will work but for a significant number of children yes we need that but we need to turbocharge it with some more um more well more 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 well more structured um intervention so a speech and language therapist might see a child sitting at table say oh you know i don't think small children should be sitting at tables i think they should be playing and enjoying themselves the behavior analyst will probably well should be saying um well yes they need to play but they also need to do this so once you start with these slight differences um of of perspective it makes things really difficult now clearly it would be remiss of me to go into a home and say well you must only listen to a behavior analyst because i can't say that because i have to it would be an unprofessional thing to do but what you need to be able to say to parents is i need to explain to you that if, if, if this is what behavior analysis is and as such these these principles need to underpin everything that you do and that you have choices of who you will choose to to work with your child but i need to inform you that some of those things might be at odds um, and that that you make that you that you have to be able that's what i explain to my students and super you have to be able to explain these things to parents if you don't you're not doing your job properly the the other point i think is that i'll often find certain professionals are, um, are, are better coming in at certain times so i'm very often invited into a home um, when a child is on a, a early intensive behavioral intervention program pretty full-on and uh, the mother and father go, we need a speech and language therapist and they'll, they'll bring me in and I'll say to them, you don't need a speech and language therapist at all. You guys are working on motivation and reinforcement and having a child be able to sit and attend. You're doing great. But I'll tell you what, once you've moved past the mans and the tacks, um, a speech and language therapist might be, be but that might be a good time to come and say, right, well, we've got a child who's commenting and requesting, manding or tackling. Where are the language steps we go for next? And as you both know, you would com you would complement that with an assessment such as ABLES or VVMAP or the other um, useful, well, there are many useful ways that all professionals can help, but certainly something I've been doing a great deal recently is when you have children who are starting to work on speech, um, the, the behavior analysts don't realize, and why should they? Because we can't know everything, that speech production is a highly uh, rule-governed system. Every sound in the world is um, it has three dimensions. So uh, laryngeal function, voice we call that, place in your mouth where you make it, and the manner in which you make it. And what speech and language therapists are really, really good at is this real understanding of what we call phonetics and phonology. So understanding how sounds are produced, what, what sounds are easier to produce than others, depending on the language you speak, that would be very different if you were speaking Malay or French or, or Welsh in my case, or English. But having some knowledge of that, being able to teach behavior analysis and basic phonetic transcription, which, which I do a lot of, using symbols so that you can actually effectively transcribe the sounds that children are making. Three or four hours training by a speech and language therapist on phonetics and phonology is a hugely, again, empowering thing for a behavior analytic team um, to, oh, so that's how speech, I never realized. So it means that instead of with the best will in the world, what they're often doing is randomly putting sounds together. Quite often I'll go and see children and I'll, their a, a behavioral team will be working with them and they'll be working on sounds. And imagine the child is three. And you, you might say, well, the sounds you're working on, we wouldn't expect the typically developing child to make those sounds until they were five. So that sort of knowledge can be helpful. And the one of, one of the many purposes of our clinical exits network was to be able to, if when, when families 
wanted a speech and language therapist. We wanted to have a register of, of ABA friendly speech and language therapists, if you like. Not that not all of them want to become BCBAs, not all of them want to become registered therapists, but people who are sympathetic to and interested in, which which means that when parents um, come to us and ask for, uh, we're not a recruitment agency, we don't have the capacity. We do this for the love of it in our, what we laughably call our free time. But when parents come to us, we're able to say, well, the, these are some of the uh, uh, ABA oriented speech and language therapists in Britain. And we, 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 if you call them into your home, you know you're not going to be wasting valuable time and money arguing about why it is that you want ABA that's a given when they come and that and I know that's been um, incredibly helpful so the the issue of effective constructive and courteous um, multidisciplinary collaboration is one that clearly we all aspire to at all times and sometimes it gets a bit rocky but um, fingers crossed in the clinical excellence network we've all been nice to each other <laughs> no one's disappeared <laughs> no one's been blocked <laughs> so it sounds yeah. like there, there is um, there is an overlap in our scope of practice, um, but I think we have to be really aware of how we may lack in how we have different scope of competencies and 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 how we're we were maybe competent in a different way and how we can kind of work together to, to, you know, yeah, to provide better services for the kids that we work with. So it's, it looks like we're doing the same thing because, you know, we're working with kids, you know, we're trying to build language, you know, trying to get them to, um, you know, vocalize a lot more, but really like when it comes to the scope of competence, we're so different. Well, you know, like, especially with a speech pathologist, like, I'm not trained in all those areas that you just mentioned, you know, like this three dimension, or, you know, I'm completely lost, right? Uh, but I'm aware that I'm not trained, and I'll, I'll, I'll reach out. But the thing is, how, you know, again, because you have this network, and you, you kind of see that whole process um, falling into place and we're like still struggling here and trying to reach out as and when, you know, it's needed. Um, you know, cause oftentimes what happens is it's so disconnected, right? Over here, it's so disconnected, you know, parents will go to the hospital and then, you know, they'll find out about the diagnosis and then they'll engage a speech therapist in a hospital, an occupational therapist in a hospital. And then because ABA is not recognized and we're not in the hospitals, you know, and that sort of stuff. So then they have to kind of engage, you know, look for us outside of the hospital. And usually the parents that the middle person, right? So at, we're at home and then we're talking about stuff and then they bring that to the speech therapist and then the speech therapist tells the parent and then they come back and then they tell us. So it's just so disconnected. And while we know that, and we often tell a parent, okay, so could you please ask the speech therapist, you know, um, about these things, you know, can you please ask them about these things? So then, but that's that, that's where it is. That's where we're at. You know, we hardly ever talk to each other on the phone or, you know, meet each other even. Um, but at see, we do have an in-house speech therapist and that's been uh, wonderful. Like we were able to just kind of touch base and say, hey, so what do you think? Where do you think we're at? You know, and all that. And she gets what we're doing. But, you know, it sounds like that's what we need to do, like this whole network thing um, to see who's interested and in, in kind of what, what do you think we should do? <laughs> in Malaysia, when everything is just so disconnected, um, I mean, I have a lot of respect for speech therapists. I've worked with a lot of really, really excellent speech therapists and they've been really open too, you know, to, to us coming in and, and sharing ideas and listening to them and, and all that. But it's just right where we're at right now. It just seems like it's almost a really, really huge task. Um, yeah. And, and I sympathise and agree, and I certainly wouldn't want to give the impression that everything in Britain works wonderfully and it's seamless, because, because it's not, and I don't think it is anywhere. And I can tell you that categorically, because I work in other contexts. I've, I've worked for several years with American military families 
in the UK. So we're having to follow their entire system of how they organize services and bill. And believe you me, that's that's tricky. Um, and uh, I, my husband works in international development, so he works all over the world. So I'm often with him in different countries and wherever I am, because I'm often there for quite a while, I usually find out what's going on and say, can I lend a hand? So I'm currently involved in some ongoing projects in Botswana, where my husband was for a while, where in Botswana, which is a huge country, they've got, um, they had when I was there, four speech and language therapists for the whole country, but and I was working in a school where they were interested in ABA, so you can imagine the task in front of them. The, the, the point you make, I think, is a really interesting one. We, we're often, th this disconnect between um, what we might call medical issues, educational issues, social issues, and certainly in Britain, a lot of speech and language therapists do work for the NHS, which means that essentially you're working on a quasi-medical model and clearly the issues of the children we work with, they're, they're, not, they're not medical issues, they're educational issues. Yes, I understand that you often have to access a paediatrician for a diagnosis, but after that, um, so as you say, putting all these pieces of the jigsaw together, the, the without uh, doing it seamlessly and without um, disrespecting or undermining someone's professional background, which I think is always an issue. Uh, and, but I think also that's an issue for any profession. Uh, when I walk, I, I've worked in schools for 25 years, I've been to hundreds of schools. And however, however pleasant and engaging I try and be, whether I'm a speech and language therapist or a board certified behavior analyst, the issue is very clear. You are in there because someone thinks that what's being done isn't good enough and needs to be done better. It's the equivalent of someone coming into my house and running their fingers around my counters in my kitchen or checking that I've cleaned my toilets. There's, there's, a, there's an invasiveness about it. So particularly as behaviour analysts, I think we have a responsibility as the newest kids on the block to be, um, be humble. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and I think when you become a behavior analyst, because it is so powerful, it's so life changing. There is there is a tendency to go, "Wow, this stuff is great! I, I know this stuff that other people don't know, and I'm going to tell them about it." But that can come across as arrogant. So, as as a behavior analyst, the best thing I think you can do is to be going to people in more established professions and saying to them. What is it that you want this child to do or you need this child to do? Tell me so I can help do that. Because that is essentially the job of the behavior analyst. That's what I found so liberating about it. All the woolly ideas of things that I wanted to do, the speech and language, that I would like this child to be doing it, and I couldn't really put it together. Once I had the skills as a behavior analyst, I literally had the tools. So other professionals love it, OT, speech and language, I say, the child, these are my aims, the child needs to do X, Y, and Z. I always say to them, mm -hmm. get the BCBA to do your work for you. That's what they're there for. Go and tell them and they will put together a program. They'll sort out all the stuff about um, data collection and baselines. And then when you tell them that, they go, oh, right, so they're gonna make my job easier. Yes, that's the whole point, as opposed to seeing yourself as a standalone and and i work an awful lot with music therapists now they're, they're, they're in terms of aba music therapies they're, they're, most people would say they're very different worlds where the music therapies are very organic and creative mm -hmm. and there's no uh, data collection they don't want to see horrid graphs and charts and they think things like that are creepy and they're impinging on an interaction but if you as the behavior analyst say, which I do with a lot of my clients, I love music therapy. I can clearly see the changes it makes. All we need to do is measure the changes. So the changes are going to be simple things like, can we measure how many times this child is looking at you? Let's compare it from session one to session 10. How many mans is he using? How many tacks is he using? How many physical approaches? And when you start doing that, music therapists go, well, this is great. Basically, you're giving me proof that what I do is really working, which I knew anyway, but I didn't have proof. So like, job done. Who isn't happy with that? Right. Instead of saying that, well, you're not evidence-based and therefore we shouldn't be doing that. Um, it, you know, it's funny how we think about this and we say, um, oh, it doesn't work. But everyone in the everyone knows that music changes moods and change, you know, people and how we feel. And it's so funny when well, you know, or like Lego therapy. I don't know if you've heard of that, um, Bethan. Um, so Certainly. I think it's just more trying to figure out, you know, how to make it work 
for the child? You know, how can we make this, um, you know, again, going back to the seven dimensions, making sure that um, everything that we're doing, it's back to the principles, you know, it's backed up by signs and the approach is, it could be music, it could be blocks, it can be, I don't know, anything really. Um, yeah, so that's- it, it, You're so right, sorry to interrupt. I was just something I'm so, I feel you know, very strongly about, but one of the most useful things that I was taught and, and CY knows who I'm talking about, Professor Carl Hughes at Bangor, who has been a great influence uh, on me professionally and a, and a great friend. He always talks about the difference between evidence-based practice and evidence-making practice. Now, clearly, if everyone said there's no evidence, that we'd never do anything, we'd be stuck. What you want to be doing is say, oh, that sounds interesting. Let's see if, if, if we can, is there evidence for it? And if there is, great. And if not, we'll, we'll rethink that. And I think back to a project I did several years ago, an MSc project with an OT an occupational therapist in a, in a special school in Anglesey and and she was really up for it and we we there were several interventions part of a sensory diet that we used and we measured their efficacy with with children and it, it demonstrated within the context of that dissertation that it didn't make much difference now she didn't she didn't sulk or get upset about that she she was interested in it and thought okay well clearly there's things I need to uh, think about um, and the one of my, well, I have many um, inspiring behavior analysts that I listen to and uh, think about and read, but Susan Friedman particularly is someone who is very interesting. And she talks always about that a behavior analyst needs to be like a tennis player, constantly ready, bouncing on the balls of their feet. We're not static. We don't say this is it. We say this is the position we're in now. We might be here tomorrow. And I think any of us, when we explain Skinner's theory or, 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 or it, ways of looking at uh, reinforcement and punishment, which I must point out that behavior analysts don't use punishment in that lay sense of punishing someone. Punishment, all it means is that we reduce the behavior. Reinforcement means we increase the behavior. All of us would admit fully that the model is a very crude one at present, that we're working on quite a basic model and that things will change. And, and as an example of that, I spent Sunday with, with a homeopath. Now, a lot of behavior analysts might say, well, homeopathy has nothing to do with what we're... I'm, I, I went with an open mind. She invited me for lunch. I was very interested in what she had to say. I questioned a lot of what she talked about and she answered and was interested. And she was also interested in behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. so this, this clearly, neither of us shut the other one down. It, everyone has something interesting to offer. And for parents who, who, who I work with who might say, oh, I don't want my child to eat this or that, or perhaps they, 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 I don't want them to gluten or gluten or casein, you say, oh, well, that's interesting. Now, if, you, if, we want to, if we want to see if that makes an effect, we need to design an intervention to look at behaviors and measure. And, that, and that's, that's a big ask. Um, because it is hard work, we, we know, but I think going back to the point of behavior analysis, it's, if there's no, it's not a magic treatment. Wouldn't we all love to have a wand and wave it and everything uh, is, is solved instantly? Uh, nothing is. Um, so yes, that whole point of what is evidence uh, and, and, and if we don't have it at evidence, how can we start building evidence for what mm -hmm. it is that we want to do because we we owe it to the children that we work with the clock is ticking we cannot waste time doing things for children that aren't working and we can do that in a polite and respectful manner and acknowledge that many of us are doing the best we can but quite often are doing things that are not effective and I put myself in that category very very strongly I look back at 15 years of work that I did and I tried my best and I worked really hard and I really cared for it. But hand on my heart, a lot of what I did was not effective. And that is not good enough for the people that I serve. Yeah. So, like, like sorry, I'm, I have so many things in my <laughs> mind. <laughs> like, how do I put this? But yeah, I, I certainly, I totally agree, um, you know, with like in ABA, you know, evidence-based, it's science. But I also think that ABA is not a rocket science. Like, you know, I think, I don't know, personally, I think one of the things that we often think is that as behavior analysts, we must go into the house. We must come up with this really fancy or really complicated intervention for the child. But actually, in reality, that's probably not 
what we need to do at all you know like when especially uh, you know link back to what you say just now in regards to working with like the music therapies you know i think the thing that we can offer them is as simple as you know just collect the data you know collect the the how many times they look at the therapies you know the i um yeah all the interaction communication because that's what we are good at we are good at you know observing we are good at picking up all these like nitty-gritty things and then we are good at putting them into graphs so i think that's Another attitude that we can have as well is that, you know, everything that we can offer, you know, is not just limited to this really complex side of the ABA. We can offer as simple as just data collection or just observation. And like you say, put ourselves on the humble side, you know, be humble and learn from each other. And I think that's probably one of the one of the key, one of the tips to, you know, how to work really nicely and effectively with other professions in the field. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, see why B.F. Skinner, our founding father, would be so proud to hear you say that, because as you know, what he pointed out, parsimony, simplicity, needs to be at the heart of what we do. And I, perhaps it's because, perhaps it's because I'm old and I've done this a long time, but I have no issues whatsoever with saying, we just need to keep it simple. We'll measure this. And if they have I, I think because I have a foot in ABA and SLT, I feel that I can look at the, the, the strengths of each and the, the areas of need, if you like, of each. And I think one of the things I do see with many behavioural analysts, particularly um, people who are new in the field, who are, you, know, you have to be clever to be a behavioural analyst, you have to be very disciplined, you have to be hardworking, it's hard work to become a behavioural analyst. Um, it's harder to study as a behavioural analyst than it is to train as a speech and language therapist, for example. So they, they come in and they sometimes want to dazzle. And I always talk about the lever arch file of doom. You know, you can go into a house or, or, or a clinic and you, you see this enormous file. Now, again, I'm not scheduling. What does it mean? What are you summarizing? And sometimes data collection becomes almost a fetish in itself. Um, and, and people, data, data tells a story, that's all it is, there's a story, what's the story, tell me the story, and it does concern me sometimes when I see a team and I say, what does the data tell me, summarise it for me, and sometimes they, they're so busy collecting data, now this is a really important aspect, and I will say to them, I'm looking at your file and I don't get it, I'm a board certified behavior. I don't understand what's going on. You can't explain it to me. So if you can't explain it to me or summarize it to me, what hope has a skeptical educational official or a head teacher or a parent or, or a grandparent who is funding some of this stuff and says, what am I spending my money on? What's going well? What are you doing? What's going well? What is it? So having the, the courage and the, and the discipline to say, do not just get involved in data collection for the sake of it. And more and more in my job, I have to say, it's going into home programs which have totally gone down a rabbit hole like that and saying, hey, hang on, this, this doesn't make any, any sense at all. Now, there's a whole other issue around collecting data. I won't even touch on that um, there. But yeah, keep it simple. Right. What's, what's the acronym? KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Well, clearly I'm not going to say that to anyone, <laughs> but that's, that's what I'm saying to myself. <laughs> or just have parsimony written in bold, you know, and... Everywhere, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Wow. So we've covered a lot of stuff, you know, um, but then we, we hardly have to ask any question. You kind of just share with us everything that, you know, we want to know about your job as a speech pathologist, as a BCBA, and, and you've shared with us some tips on how to build bridges rather than burning them. Um, and I think my biggest takeaway would be, um, you know, just... Practice within your scope of competence when you don't know. Reach out, ask someone. Keep things simple. Start small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and you know, at the end of the day, it's, it sounds like your, you know, what you're sharing about your role as BCBA it's, and, and how it has complemented, you know, your, um, the speech pathologist part of you is now you have a better way of teaching. Um, you know how to teach, you know the art of teaching, you're good at it, and now you can actually teach those skills that you have learned um, 
you know, in regards to um, what the kid should have, what the kid should learn. And so now you're able to get them to do it in a more efficient way. Yes, and, and, and thank you. I think that's a better summary of what I hope to, <laughs> to say to you than I could have possibly made myself. Uh, and, and I think the final thing is to say to those who are embarking on careers as behavior analysts, say, you, 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 know, you learn about reinforcement, you learn about making things um, attractive or interesting to people. Well, the, that starts with you. You have to make yourself a pleasant, attractive, interesting person. And that's quite often as simple as um, when I have uh, students and they're going into schools, I say, you be the first one to get up and brush the floor. You go and wash the coffee cups. You ask if there's anything that needs photocopying. You establish yourself in our terminology as a conditioned reinforcer, where when you come in through the door, they don't think, oh, God, there's that person with that file full of weird stuff I don't get. It's that, there's that really nice young woman or man who is here to make my life so much easier and for these kids to learn faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, do we still have any more questions? I feel like we covered everything. <laughs> well, I kind of want to clone her and then bring her to Malaysia and then, you know, have her here with us. And that's that's what I have in that mind. I know that's not possible, especially with... Well, you know, if, 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 there any, if there are any jobs going in Malaysia, I'm telling you, I'm on the first plane out of here because I couldn't think of a nicer place to be. I love Malaysia. I just think everything about it is absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, okay. bear me in mind. <laughs> All right. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Bethan. And thank, um, thank you for sharing with, you know, our audience here in Malaysia. I'm sure they got a lot out of it. We will have parents listening. We have professionals. I'm sure we have speech pathologists listening and a lot of BCBAs or aspiring BCBAs listening to our podcast. So thank you. Thank you for sharing with us all that you know, and I'm sure you have a lot more to share. So hopefully we can get you back next time. Thank you so much for having me, Sien, and CY. It's, it's a great pleasure. And like I said to you, speech and language therapists have no issues talking. That's what we love <laughs> to do. But I hope it was helpful. And if anyone has any uh, questions or additional things that, that they would like to ask me or, or directions in which they want to be pointed, um, I'm sure that CY, you'll coordinate that. And I'm, I'm more than happy to help. I know how, I know from being a parent myself in that situation, what a really, really scary uh, time it is and I also know how many good professionals there are how many young people there are who are really changing the face of what we do so it's very exciting to be to be part of that okay so thank you thank you Bethan take care stay safe bye thank you thank Lovely you to see you ladies bye, bye. That was Bethan sharing with us her experiences as a board certified behavior analyst as well as a speech language pathologist. Once again, we thank Bethan for joining us at Seed Podcast.